All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week um, as we are doing this morning, this afternoon. Did I say this good morning? I'm sorry. Good afternoon. We're at a different time today, so things are a little... <laughs> I'm all confused. <laughs> anyway, um, the show is recorded and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think that might be interested in any of the um, shows we have on here. Uh, for anyone who's not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, similar to the state library in other states. So we provide services to all types of libraries. Um, so you will find things on our show for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, schools, um, universities, corrections, museums, archives, anything and everything. Our, really our only criteria on the show is that it's something for libraries, something libraries are doing, something we think um, they could be doing. Um, interesting resources and services and products for libraries. Uh, we have guest speakers that come in on the show from all across the country sometimes, and we have library commission staff that come on the show sometimes. Um, and today we have a mixture of that. Um, and today we are talking about our 2021 One Book, One Nebraska selection, Prairie Forge, uh, the extraordinary story of the Nebraska scrap metal drive of World War II. Oh, and metal is a typo there, that's okay. <laughs> Um, and so this will actually be a, a, top, a session that might be good for anybody to watch, not just libraries, to find out about the book that we're hoping a lot of uh, um, everybody in Nebraska might read. So I will hand it over to, I'm not sure whoever's going to be talking first. <laughs> I can start first. Um, and you guys so, can introduce yourselves as you do talk. I didn't, I didn't um, mention that. I didn't introduce everybody, but I figure as you guys come up with your parts and whatnot, um, you can introduce yourselves. Yeah, I'm Tessa Terry. I'm the communications coordinator at the Nebraska Library Commission. So we work with the Nebraska Center for the Book, Humanities Nebraska, as well as the author themselves, just to get this program working every year. So um, do you guys want to introduce yourselves first and then we can kind of move on? Uh, Christy, do you want to start? Sure. I'm Christine Walsh, and I work at the Kearney Public Library, but I'm president of the Center for the Book Board. And so um, we have a great board that helps put together these kinds of programs, work with the committees that select um, the One Book, One Nebraska, um, and lots of other programs that support readers and interesting conversations across the state. Becky? I'm Becky Faber. I am a member of the board um, for the Center for the Book, and I was the committee chair, selection committee chair for <clears throat> the One Book, One Nebraska project. Ron? I'm Rod Wagner. I'm director of the Nebraska Library Commission and an ex officio Center for the Book board member, and I'm on Becky's committee. Erica? I am Erica Hamilton. I'm the Director of Literary Programs for Humanities Nebraska, and I'm also an ex officio board member of the Nebraska Center for the Book. And of course, James. Hey, everybody. I'm Jim Kimball. I teach at Seton Hall University, where I'm a professor of communication and the arts. I'll ask I'm not on any of these boards, but uh, this sounds like it's a great lineup. So, Krista, do you want to go to our next slide? Becky, or not Becky, Christy, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the Center for the Book and what it does? Sure, I would be happy to. Um, the Center for the Book is an affiliate of the Library of Congress National Center for the Book, and so there are 
centers for the book in each um, state and several territories as well. And the goal is to um, kind of be the face of the Library of Congress outside of Washington, D.C., but also to support local um, or regional literary programs that support literacy, um, encouraging to learn more about the wonderful authors that each state or um, each state has, um, and to work in Congress with, you know, humanities organizations, um, authors, local book groups, all of those sorts of things. So the Center for the Book is promoting authors, writers, publishers, all of those um, in our particular states. And it is a volunteer board of people um, from across the state of Nebraska that make up the committees that select the One Book, One Nebraska, and um, other programs, the uh, Celebration of Nebraska Books and things like that. And of course, always working with the, um, the wonderful people at the Library Commission and Humanities Nebraska because it, it's a team effort. So I think that's what I've got. Thanks. Becky, would you tell us a little bit about the selection process and how we pick books each year? Absolutely. The books are nominated by the general public. And um, so our deadline for that is June 15th, and that may seem like quite a ways away, but uh, I would encourage people to check the One Book, One Nebraska website, and um, they'll find a link I believe I'm right, uh, yes. for nominating a book, as well as the list of books that have previously uh, been chosen as a One Book, One Nebraska. The website will also lay out the criteria that um, the book must be written by a Nebraskan, and uh, that could be someone currently living in Nebraska or who has previously lived in Nebraska. Uh, the book uh, could have a Nebraska theme or setting. Uh, so those are the first two criteria. And then uh, two other important uh, criteria. The book must be in print and readily available. And also the book should lend itself to group discussions. So once June 15 has passed, uh, the committee looks at the nominations to make sure that uh, the nominated books fit criteria and then they begin to review the books um, for uh, 2021 we had a committee of six readers who reviewed uh, the nominations and uh, we were able to move forward on 16 books that fulfilled criteria and uh, each book is given at least two readings. So we're very much reading thoroughly. Uh, we're giving feedback. Um, every book goes, as I said, to at least a second reader, sometimes a third reader. Um, so we're, we're looking very seriously um, at these books to make sure that they are um, applicable and also will engage readers in a strong discussion. So um, it's a very thorough process. And I would say it's also, for those of us who love to read, it's a very fun process. And we always end up with a selection that is exciting to present to the public. Thank you. And later on, we will have a slide that shows everyone what, where the nomination form is and what that looks like just for your guys's um, knowledge. Also, you can nominate all year round, even if the uh, uh, deadline has passed, you can nominate the very next day for the next year's book. So we never close the nomination period. It's always available for anyone to log on and nominate. Um, Chris, Krista, can you go to the next slide for me? And um, so here are all of the titles. Rod, will you speak a little bit just about the history of our One Book, One Nebraska program? Uh, sure. The program uh, actually began back in 2005 uh, during the uh, Willa Cather Foundation's 50th anniversary 
year, the foundation had um, planned a number of activities and events and events during the year to celebrate uh, that anniversary. And one of the uh, activities uh, was the statewide reading promotion that they initiated. Uh, in January of that year, January 2005, uh, Governor Mike Johans encouraged Nebraskans to read Willa Cather's My Antonia. Uh, the foundation uh, sought other organizations to uh, help promote and uh, assist in uh, encouraging Nebraskans to read the book and to uh, join in celebrating the foundation's uh, many activities and events and accomplishments during their first 50 years. So uh, we were very uh, pleased to be involved in that along with uh, the Nebraska Library Association, uh, Nebraska, Nebraska Humanities Council, or as we know today, Humanities Nebraska, um, regional library systems, Nebraska libraries, uh, these organizations all contributed uh, and it was a very successful program. It was so much so that uh, people started asking, well, what are we going to do next year? What book are we going to uh, read and promote? So there was much encouragement to continue the program and we did that. Uh, it evolved over the years and now we have a fairly well uh, uh, thought out and uh, a good process for arriving at a selection each year. So that's uh, it's been a very uh, it's been a fun program to work with. So, but anyway, uh, credit the Willa Cather Foundation for actually being the uh, group uh, organization that got us started back in 2005. Krista, can you go to the next slide for me, please? So that brings us to this year's selection, Prairie Forge. And, and once again, I must have copied this title from the first slide because there's a typo. <laughs> Just like everything I write, apparently. Um, James, it's, we don't always get the author um, to be involved every year. Sometimes we pick um, books where the author authors passed away or just isn't available to be a part of the program. So we are really excited to have you here. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about um, just your book in general? Sure. Um, and first of all, I kind of like this title better. The, the meta drive sounds very <laughs> philosophical. <laughs> um, so Rod was mentioning uh, Willa Cather and how important she is to this program a little bit ago. and uh, I, I'm not really fit to carry Willa Cather's, you know, uh, anything. Um, but I think that this story, um, I'm, I'm glad that it's in the, that array of books that we saw a slide or two ago, um, because this story really isn't my story. It's the story of World War II Nebraskans, um, and what they did was just tremendous. So that the book that this story that is so central to this state's identity at a formative time in american history can be part of this program and that the word about what these scrappers did during world war ii can spread further across the state of nebraska my home state um it's an incredible honor so i'm glad to be here to support it and i would just like um all of those viewing to know they can type in questions at any time. Crystal is keeping an eye out for those. So if you guys um, want to ask a question of James or any of us, please do so and we'll we'll get to those as they come in kind of sporadically. Yeah. Um, so about the One Book One Nebraska program, do you want to go to the next slide for me, Krista? Um, we have a lot of ways that you guys can be involved in this program. We have book club kits that you can check out from the Nebraska Library Commission or your regional library systems as well if you want to have a book group uh, read this book and talk about it. Um, we have an events page. We would love for you to send us information about the events you're having um, around the One Book One Nebraska title. So we would love to get those posted to help you um, 
market those to your community and those around you. And then uh, that kind of leads me into our Humanities Nebraska connection with Erica. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how Humanities Nebraska and your Speakers Bureau, Bureau really plays a part in the One Book One Nebraska? Yes, um, so Humanities Nebraska, we provide the funding for those book kits that Tessa was talking about. So we support One Book One Nebraska in that way, but we also use our Speakers Bureau. Um, do we have that available so we can show them how to find our Speakers Bureau on our website? I believe it, maybe it's on the next slide, Krista. Go one more. Because James has um, very generously offered to be in our Speakers Bureau, which means that any library, any school, any public um, organization who would like to have James come and give a virtual online presentation about the book, um, can do that by contacting him, getting it scheduled, and then going onto um, our website. Um, here you can see our new website. It was newly designed. We just went live at the beginning of the year, so this is our new design. You go to Speakers Bureau. And the best way to find James, I would say, you can do it either go by going to Catalog or Speakers. But let's click on Catalog. scroll down a little bit and then um, where that little pull down menu is for speaker you can find him in there click on him and there's his there's his program prairie forge the extraordinary story of the scrap metal drive or the scrap meta drive <laughs> whichever one he wants to talk about um, but there's a there's an explanation a description of his program and his contact if you go into speaker info you'll have his contact information so you can contact him and, and schedule the the program and then once you get that done you'll want to go um, actually if you click on how to book a speaker Um, you just read that information. Um, these programs are meant to be for public, for the for the general public. Um, we typically do not do ones that are private only, even though I mean we we have in the past, but mostly these are for general public presentations. And so just read through that information. If you scroll down, there's a step one that's talking about selecting the speaker contacting the speaker and then arranging for funding and if you click on that online application um, a lot of you have probably applied already for our speakers bureau so you know how this process works you you go in here you log in and then you simply just apply for funding and um, it's a $50 application fee but we pay um, James for his stipend which is more than $50 and so in that way, we help provide funding for any organization in Nebraska to have a virtual One Book One Nebraska program with James. Thanks, Erica. We love You're having welcome. the Speakers Bureau as a program um, that goes along with One Book One Nebraska because it makes it so easy for the libraries in Nebraska to um, just have access to so many presenters that go along with the books that they're reading to let them dive in deeper and learn more. So we really encourage if you're um, doing anything with the One Book program, book a speaker and um, get them on the book so that you guys can just expand that uh, that learning and that conversation that goes around the title. We do have on our um, One Book One Nebraska webpage, we have a list of other World War II speakers that um, might fit in as well. So if james is busy on the one day you want him to speak there might be some other options as well um, and there are just so many topics around world war ii that you could dive into and maybe keep exploring so we just encourage you to use the speakers bureau as much as you can as a library and a book group um, 
with that in mind, um, James, do you want to tell us a little bit about your story, um, about the book, and then if you wanted to read any parts of it, um, we could do that and then take some questions. We can do that. So as as the the, the title uh, you know gives it all away, I suppose this is really a story about what Nebraskans did during World War II. I thought it was pretty extraordinary when I came across it. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that I'd never heard of it. So I'm a World War II historian. Uh, my focus is on domestic propaganda during World War II. And I was doing research a number of years ago at the advertising archives at Duke University. And I came across uh, in this archive a folder that was labeled uh, scrap metal drives. And inside was this booklet from that had been created by the Omaha World Herald in 1942. And of course, I knew the World Herald. I had been grown up reading it, you know, uh, every weekend reading about the the Cornhusker football team and so on when I was growing up in Norfolk. So it really piqued my interest, and it talked about this drive that, as a historian of World War II, I, it was astonishing. I had never heard of this. Um, so it was Henry Dorley uh, talking about what Nebraska had accomplished in the summer of 1942, how prior to that, uh, Americans had been encouraged by the government, by the Roosevelt administration to collect metal as widely as possible because it was necessary to keep the this, this steel, uh, steel factories going, how those appeals were falling on deaf ears, I suppose, and how Dorley figured out a way to make it happen within Nebraska. He made it into a competition. The competition was at numerous levels, but the primary fronts was county versus county. Uh, so I grew up in Madison County, so I was very interested from the start. How did Madison County do? Uh, they ended up in sixth place in the competition. Uh, and it occurred to me that this is the kind of story that Nebraskans would be interested in because I assumed most of them had not heard about the scrap metal drive. Um, and the inherent competitiveness of Nebraskans uh, would have this kind of story appeal to them as well. So it's the story about Henry Dorley had this great idea for getting Nebraskans involved in the war, how against all odds they succeeded and set an example for the rest of the country. And then in the fall of 1942, how the rest of the country adopted what they called the Nebraska Plan uh, and had a state versus state competition, uh, which was eventually, unfortunately, won by Kansas. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is uh, what it's all about. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for James? Or do you prefer Jim? Either works fine. Uh, most people just call me Jim or even Jimble. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if anybody has any questions, yeah, type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I can pass them on. Um, one of the, while well, they're asking questions, one of the features that I really enjoy when I'm giving presentations in Nebraska. Um, so I know um, Becky is, is here, uh, who is the director of the Seward Library. So I've given presentations there in Norfolk and Omaha, is that Nebraskans do ask a lot of good questions after presentations. So I'm mm -hmm. eager to be a part of uh, these presentations. Yeah, I wonder it? if Becky would want to talk about what they've done there. Um, Becky Baker from our Seward Public Library is on with us. Um, uh, Becky, would you want to talk a little about about what you've sure you had at your library? I've unmuted you. Surprise. <laughs> <Yeah>. Good thing <laughs> I'm here. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think the first program we had, Jim, was Rosie the Rosie the Riveter one. Is that right? Do you remember? A, that sounds right. Yeah. And we've had him back many times he's a wonderful presenter i can't say enough good things about him you will never be sorry <laughs> because really who likes history but jim makes it very interesting he comes up with stories we don't know about um and think how did we go to school all those years and never hear this story it really makes history come alive and when it's about nebraska it's even more important that we know i think what life was like then and we can appreciate what all they did 
So I don't know what else you want me to say, Jim. Anything come to mind? Hmm. You know what was one of the really nice elements of the the way you set it up there in Seward was uh, the local bookstore uh, always got involved, and that seemed right. to get an additional level of enthusiasm and excitement mm -hmm. on the part of everybody. Right. And Carla was very happy to be involved. <laughs> Got to unmute myself. Um, we do have a, a, a suggested question here um, for, for Jim. Uh, what do you think will surprise readers most about the book? Hmm. My first impression so happened at all that apparently none of us knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, my first impression is that uh, I think almost all Nebraskans have heard the name Henry Dorley, mm -hmm. but very pe few people know who this person was. They think of it as a zoo um, in Omaha. Of course, it is a zoo. Uh, but the fact that it was a real person who had a history and uh, not only just being a person having a history, but played a pivotal role in American history, I think will be uh, enlightening. For people i kind of mm. assumed he was some sort of big philanthropist or something with the zoo i've been to this henry Dorley zoo in omaha many times and never actually really bothered to research about him mm. yeah. let me offer another response to that question since i'm thinking about it um something else that i, I think is a useful sort of conversation to have during a pandemic uh, uh, in, in particular, is that this story talks a lot about how the different parts of Nebraska, the uh, rural and the urban and different uh, uh, ethnicities and groups, um, all these rivalries that existed back in the 1940s, in many respects are still with us today, um, how I don't want to say that they overcame differences, but rather that they found ways to collaborate and to work together. Um, how, in a sense, that the, this drive was a unification drive, bringing people together and working on a team. And in a time of a pandemic, that's really a message that I think we all ought to be, uh, ought to be of interest and will surprise people about Nebraska history. Um, okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we do have a comment from uh, one of our libraries here. Let's see, it's a long one here. So I'm reading, I was just reading it to make sure whatever she had said here. She said, um, and this is, uh, let's see. all right. Um, I've been researching this topic in our old newspapers. I found an article from the local air base um, it was for, this is uh, Brown County. It started out residents of Brown County, and this is the um, quote, the title of the article from the Air Force Base. So I want to preface that before I say this, because uh, it says, get in the scrap and help kill the Jap. Mm -hmm. um, she says, I was kind of surprised by the language, but no, for the time, I think that's Makes sense, yeah. Caught me off guard, even found some ads for farm men and women to turn in their scrap. Mm -hmm. So there might be actually things in other, other than local papers that people have don't realize if you go looking for that. Yeah, now that this book is out and people are hopefully more reading it this year, they might find some more. Is this stuff that you had found and you were doing your research as well, Jim? Absolutely. I spent a lot of time in the uh, st the State Historical Library looking at microfilm, um, and of course, newspapers.com, which has lots of old microfilmed uh, newspapers as well. Um, but yeah, this is a state story. It's a national story. But as the comment implied, it's also a local story. Um, so I really hope that anyone who reads it will spend some time going to look at their own uh, local repositories and finding what local history is there about this drive, and maybe even if possible, uh, reaching out to folks at retirement homes, because um, many of the scrappers are still with us, and they have stories and memories of that time that are just precious. It's, it's really interesting, I think, and also important to memorialize those stories. 
Yeah, and this is um, Gail Irwin, who's a director at our um, Ainsworth Public Library, had found this particular article in Brown County. Yeah. Excellent. Very interesting. Um, Becky from Seward wants you to talk about the video too. Okay. Uh, so actually, the the first this project uh, took place in multiple phases. It it, it began as a journal article uh, in Great Plains Quarterly, which is published by the University of Nebraska Press. And so there's that Nebraska connection. And in the course of writing that reasonably short article, I had come across a number of visuals that I thought were pretty striking, uh, including the image that's on the front of the book here uh, with the two women um, very uh, self-consciously and yet confidently standing atop you know, this, this uh, pile of, of metal, this load of metal, and uh, being proud at their role. Um, and we have to think, you know, what would that have communicated back in 1942? Um, you know, we see it as an image of empowerment, and I think it was, but it would have been very striking uh, for people of, of that time. But in any case, I had happened to have just started at Seton Hall about that time, and so I had my article manuscript, and it so happened that my next door neighbor, I uh, was a movie maker, Tom Rondinella. And I don't know what possessed me, but one day I just walked into his office and I said, Tom, I think this story, holding up a copy of my manuscript, would be a great documentary. And he said, huh, I'll read it. And then he came back to me a week later. He said, I read it. Let's make it. And <laughs> I hadn't you know, thought that it, I would be involved. I just thought it was a great story that he could do something with, um, but he wanted to involve me. And so I ended up making uh, this documentary called Scrappers, How the Heartland Won World War II. Um, and it offers a visual take on this story um, with lots of newsreel uh, from back in the day, as well as lots of interviews with surviving scrappers. That's cool. Is that something that we have available through here somewhere through our website, Tessa, or how do we get to watch that, that documentary? I guess is my question. We do not have um, that documentary that I know of. Um, James, how, how would we come up to find that? I know the Omaha Public Library has a couple of copies and Norfolk Public Library does. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe there's a way uh, for the Library Commissioner, the humanities uh, folks to have a copy and I can arrange to make that happen. That can be loaned out to libraries that are interested. Um, it's like I can just send one too. Mm -hmm. That can be loaned out. That's fine. Yeah, definitely. If it's available on like a DVD or something, we could definitely have it as part of the um, program. Yeah. Yeah, it's a DVD. So let me know when I can mail that to Lincoln and it can have its own adventure. <laughs> well, that so, documentary was funded by Humanities Nebraska. So the more people who see it, the better, the happier we will be. <laughs> well put. Awesome. Um, would that be something, Erica, that people could contact you guys to get a hold of, or is it mainly you know, we would you know, buy it for the library? We, we don't have it. You know, distribute it. Okay, not yeah. a problem. I want to make sure I don't point people. I don't want people going to the wrong places looking for this. So <laughs> we don't even have a copy in our office. So ah, okay, <laughs> we would we point will, up to you. Yeah, we will figure that out and make it available. Not a problem. So here, here I'll be, I'll be mailing this to you. So yeah, we go. Just people want to see what it looks like. It's the a fist holding up metal next to a barn. Appropriate. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, here we have a, a question. Um, can you talk about what motivated Henry Dorley to initiate the project in the first place in Omaha? Sure. Uh, so Dorley um, had a, a public sensibility. He had a history of uh, seeing a cause that needed to be done uh, somewhere in the state uh, and putting the resources of, of the World Herald behind that cause. Um, so he was very campaign oriented. It makes sense that he was the kind of person who would be interested in a, a drive like this. Um, but more topically in the, in the spring and, and summer of 1942, uh, there were all these national appeals with the War Production Board trying to convince Americans to gather scrap, and they were just failing miserably. Uh, and it wasn't just metal scrap, it was also rubber scrap. Uh, and how this all began was in late in June, later in June, 
1942, uh, the World Herald produced a number of stories lamenting the fate of the most recent rubber drive, this national appeal, which had failed miserably. And um, he was taking his uh, wife, Margaret Hitchcock Dorley, down to the station. Uh, she was going on a train ride somewhere. And the whole drive down, um, he, he was complaining about how Americans weren't doing anything and this rubber drive just failed and what, you know, we're not, we're going to lose this war. And at some point he paused and his wife looked at him, him and said, Henry, what are you going to do about it? So in other words, stop grousing and try to solve the problem. So he dropped her off and then he was at house in the house by himself and he stayed up late and he brainstormed this idea. Well, maybe we can get the scrap metal drive uh, into gear here in the state. We'll show how amazingly well it can be done. And then the Roosevelt administration will use our pattern as a national model. And that's precisely what happened. All right. That's awesome, yeah. And, and actually, someone from the audience had just actually commented because she's read the book that she liked. I liked this is before you even said it. I liked how Mr. Dorley's wife challenged him to do something about the scrap drive. Yes, except for but for um, Mrs. Dorley, as they would have called her at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and that that issue comes up on the book as well. Um, the scrap drive probably wouldn't have happened. So yeah. she put him in his place, I suppose. And, uh, <laughs> He, he felt challenged and he, he rose to that challenge. Very successfully, yes. Um, do you want to, is there any uh, passages or somewhere, something that you'd like to read from the book that may be of interest? I can read a little bit here. Um, yeah. So I, I, I knew ahead of time um, that this might be a possibility, so I got to choose different passages and so on. And I thought I might share about two paragraphs. This is from the introduction. And it's kind of summarizing the successes uh, of the program, uh, but also how it overcame uh, challenges. So this is from page nine. Um, so the Nebraska plan fostered remarkable successes. This is not to say that the effort had no imperfections. The World Herald's team, for example, would probably admit that it could have used much more time to plan and organize the summer campaign. After the drive started, some of the state citizens proved reluctant to take part, at least until their friends or neighbors prodded them into participation. There were even times when Dorley's ambitious plan appeared to have faltered. Such shortcomings were probably inevitable. Nebraskans were already leading busy lives when the scrap campaign, campaign came along, working, harvesting, bailing, housekeeping, and the other tasks of daily life could become overwhelming amid the labor shortages of wartime. Moreover, many citizens in the western portion of the state were already donating significant time and resources to the famous North Platte Canteen. To expect that these citizens would forget everything else in their day to engage in the hard labor of gathering scrap metal would have been quite a bit to ask. The fact that the campaign somehow found a way to succeed in spite of its shortcomings makes its dramatic story all the more remarkable and suggests that it deserves a more central place in our cultural memories of World War II. Indeed, for those who experienced it, the 1942 quest for scrap metal, what one observer called the greatest treasure hunt in history arguably had all the drama of the Battle of the Bulge and all the historical necessity of the battle for Iwo Jima. Like those battles, the search for scrap metal was dirty, sweaty, and even dangerous. Unlike those battles, however, the story of the scrappers has received little post-war attention. Perhaps these patriotic citizens would have wanted it that way, as their work was not directed at personal glory, but at community competition and patriotism. Nonetheless, some 70 years after their labors, it is high time that later generations acknowledge and appreciate their accomplishments. 
so that kind of gives an overview of the, the attitude the book takes. It's a, an admiring perspective of what they did. If I may make a comment here, um, one of the, the comments that G uh, Jim just read uh, had to do with the North Platte Canteen. And if we have people on the webinar today who have not read the 2014 uh, One Book, One Nebraska, Once Upon a Town uh, by Bob Green, it's another very parallel example of how people in Nebraska uh, worked very hard and made a solid commitment to those who were serving in World War II. And uh, at the beginning of Prairie Forge, uh, Jim sets the context for the need for scrap metal uh, coming immediately after um, the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 which again, it's, the book is just a wonderful segue of uh, what follows from our 2021 book one, Nebraska, All the Gallant Men. Um, and for people who have already read them, um, you know, we've had some just incredible response to um, the 2015 Death Zones and Darling Spies which was written by a reporter who was uh, embedded in Vietnam for seven years, um, as well as, um, I'm scrolling to find the year here, uh, but um, 2016, The Meaning of Names, uh, which also takes place during World War I and the 1918 pandemic. Um, and I so appreciate that Jim is a Nebraskan because it adds such depth and credibility to what he's exploring. And this book just works so beautifully with many of the other books that uh, deal with the commitment of Nebraskans to taking care of their own and others. It, what you said there really resonates with me because all those different contexts that those stories are taking place in are what my colleague uh, here at Seton Hall, Brian Price calls, a crucible moments, you know, those moments of stress and crisis that tell you a lot about yourself. Um, and in these times of crisis that you mentioned, we learn a lot about Nebraskans and their true character. All to the good. I also think that it encourages um, storytelling, both in the oral format and the written format. And uh, I think that many people probably have inherited scrapbooks and journals and other things from previous generations and have said, oh, gosh, what am I ever going to do with that? Uh, but sitting down and going through these materials is another amazing way to understand community and a sense of history. And um, I'm sitting right now with this scrapbook that my grandmother made during World War II. She lived in a small rural town in Iowa. And I always knew one of my uncles had been a POW in Germany, but I didn't know very much about it until I opened her scrapbook. And she has cut out all kinds of articles from the local newspaper. And it's just incredible to me historically and in a familial sense. Uh, and I hope that as people talk about Prairie Forge, they're going back and opening up lines of communication and talking with some of the elders in their communities, uh, as Jim mentioned earlier, and enhancing and enlarging the story. I love what you said there about the storytelling because every family's got World War II stories in some capacity. And so to use this as a springboard to continue those conversations and capture those where while the generations are still around to share them.
that she throws up there. Oh no, yes, he looks like Christy's frozen. Oh no. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, Christy, you froze up for a second there. Oh, you sorry. Talking. That's okay. <laughs> right when you just started talking. <laughs> I, I wasn't supposed to be talking. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat what you're trying to say there after? Oh, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to piggyback on what Becky was saying about um, family stories and using this book and the others that are um, previous one book, one Nebraska selections as a springboards to capture family stories because everybody has them, whether they were stateside or somebody was overseas or um, their relatives were in other parts of the world. Um, I think that appreciation of Everybody was impacted in some way, but there were all kinds of ways for everybody to respond in a positive way um, are really important to remember. Um, and it and continues to happen. Like you said, in Nebraska, you know, I think of the floods we had in 2019. There were incredible things that came out of all of that um, destruction and sadness, but some, wow, huge, um, bright lights and um, people unifying to help each other out. So that spirit is is still alive and well, which is great, but it's fun to see that progression through history. And I love the history part of it, so yay. You're here. All right, um, other questions anybody has? Um, we got officially five minutes left in the hour, but we did start a little late with our slight technical kind of issues at the beginning, no problem. Um, but we'll go as long as it takes for everyone to say what they want to say. Any questions anybody has? Um, please do um, get in. We did have some questions about the video, uh, the documentary scrappers. Um, we will look for more information about that, about are they allowed to show it to any to groups? And how much does it cost? How to get like for the library to purchase their own copy? Um, I'm not. I've looked, tried to look up some site licensing things. It looks like it's not part of the site license movie license that we offer here at through the commission for everybody. But there, you can reach out to um, see what it would cost. Um, but also just looking online in um, WorldCat in OCLC to see there are a lot of libraries in the state that already do own a copy of the of Scrappers. It actually came out in 2010, so this is not something recent, so maybe a little more difficult to purchase, but Seward, Plattsmouth, Omaha, Hastings, Central Community College in Hastings, that's just the first few list um, here. So uh, there are a lot of libraries in the state that do have it, and um, we'll see about looking into what the performance rights would be and how that would all work yeah I, I mean let me say for the record here and and the librarians who are logged on can spread this around to anybody else show it as many times as you like to as large an audience as you want um, uh, as the co-producer i think i can say that so <laughs> have at it uh, the more yeah. people who see this story the better it is yeah, it was hard to find out like who is in ownership. Like, who would you even talk to about it now that it's been out for a while? And so, yeah. But, yeah. We'll get that um, WorldCat reference that you had, Krista, added to the uh, One Book, One Nebraska website so people can access that there as well. Yeah. Um, they can already access the book WorldCat from that website. So we'll add the documentary to that as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. That'd be great. While we wait for any more questions to come in, um, I just wanted to give a quick plug out to one the website, um, just for people to have access to any of the um, get involved editions that we have on there, whether that's booking a humanity speaker. Um, if you do read the book, we have links to um, reviews and a questionnaire that helps us just uh, keep track of how many people used our book club kits and what they thought of the program and the book itself and that really helps us we submit a report to Erica about um, 
how we use their money and how our program's going. So that's really helpful to us. If your book clubs could fill out our um, survey forms, that's online, but we also send them out by mail to each book club kit um, recipient. Um, we've also got a Facebook page in our NLC social media where we would love to see questions or um, see the posts about the events you're hosting. And we try to keep it as up to date as possible with what's happening with the One Book program and any uh, reviews or um, pertinent information we have on there, we try to get out to you. So if you send that to us, we'll put it back out there so more people can see it, hopefully. Tessa, on the page before that, uh, could you please mention, uh, talk a little bit about the, the questions, the discussion questions? I don't know if everyone saw that oh, link. Yeah. Um, James wrote some discussion questions. Our book club recipients always request discussion questions to go along with our one book titles. And he has supplied those for us and they are available online for you from the one book website. Lots of questions. I'm not going to go through all of yeah. them. Feel free Keep to use. Group talk for a while. And what will happen is I'll give a talk and somebody will ask me those questions and I'll be stumped. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a link that does talk about find a copy of the book. And this is what I was looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. Oh, this is coming up with a lot fewer than what I had on my phone, but. It's because it's the digital commons version, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See here. There it is. There's the print book, yeah. There we go. Lots of the universities, but if I go along, there we go. Some are all public libraries, yeah. Hmm. We just ordered another book bag because the book clubs are really excited and it's getting a lot of use. So we wanted to get more books in people's hands. Awesome. Oops, let me go too far. Yeah, and here's where you can, uh, the book club kits that we have through the commission and our regional library systems. Um, this jumps you right to our book club kit for. And it looks like there's also a link to the Speakers Bureau, which will help you find it instead of trying to find the Humanities Nebraska page. Yep, right here, yep. Great. That's that how to book speaker that we showed you before, yep. On the humanities page, my email is listed. So that's my Seton Hall accounts. Um, I'm on that all the time. It's the easiest way to get in touch with me. And um, mm -hmm. please know that I'm I'm a very accessible person and I really wanna help uh, tell this story. So uh, those of you who um, have book clubs and wanna organize talks and other events, um, feel free to reach out to me and we can, we can talk about what we could do. Very good, thank you. Tessa, did you have um, wanted to show more of the slides, the rest of the slides we had, or? Yeah, can we hop to the um, One Book, One Nebraska nomination page? Let's see the book club kids in and where are we at here? There's a <laughs> Facebook page, we talked about all this, Celebration of Nebraska Books. There it is. <laughs> so, um, yes, it's on the Center for the Book, Nebraska Center for the Book website, and the nomination form is always available. This is what it looks like. We, um, this is still last year's flyer, but we um, love getting as many nominations as possible just so that we have a wide variety to pick from and 
that the board just, if we don't know about the book, we can't put it into the uh, groups being read. So if you have a book in mind, please nominate it. Um, you can nominate any book and as long as it meets those criteria, it'll be considered. So we really urge people to, if they're passionate about a book and think more Nebraskans should be reading and talking about it, we want their um, submission. If I, I could like just add one thing to that, and that is that um, the books should be for adult reading levels, not young adults and not children's. <clears throat> That is not a question I've ever thought about before, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> well, we sometimes have books that are nominated that are um, not adult level reading. And so as we go through the initial nominations and we see that something does not fit an adult audience, um, we're having to dismiss it from consideration. I see. Yeah, that's a great um, thing to mention. Maybe one day there'll be a, a one book, one Nebraska junior version for younger readers. We do have a one book for one book, one Nebraska for kids and for teen selections. They're mm -hmm. um, they're not the same program that our adult one book, one Nebraska, um, as we're talking about today is. But we um, we do have those selections that we. I think we're still working on the web page for them, but um, I know that. But yeah, that, those are programs that are available, um, but they're not nominated in quite the same way or have the same statewide reach as what we're talking about here. Yeah, one book from Nebraska Kids, one book for Nebraska Teens. Uh, it's done by our youth services coordinator here, Sally Snyder, here at the Nebraska at the Library Commission. Excellent. And every year she puts out. Um, the books that have been chosen. Um, someday maybe we could team up, possibly. <laughs> and there are some states that do have uh, those programs and um, certainly mm -hmm. we we do want to encourage everyone, regardless of age, to, to be reading. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that's unique to our program with um, the One Book, One Nebraska is that selected books need to have that Nebraska connection. And that's not true in all other states' One Book programs, but it's worked beautifully for us. And it's, it's wonderful to hear readers say, I didn't know about that, or I'm so glad I read that book because I learned something about Nebraska that I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. And what you were saying, Becky, about other states having similar programs, um, one good thing, if you can say that, out of having to do a lot of virtual programs, is you can participate across the country. So you can go to the author um, talks, you can go to the virtual discussion groups, and if you go to the center for the book, um, for whatever state it is that most interests you, they will have information um, for ways to, for you to participate. And it's really kind of a treat because you don't have to travel um, and you can learn from home too, but also participate. So kind of a, continues to broaden your horizons and support the centers for the book across the country. Mm -hmm. So I'd encourage you to check that out um, and all of the related humanities programs for their state humanities. Um, organizations as well, because there's lots of hand-in-hand -hand programming that goes into all of this. I think I like also when we're out on the nomination page here, um, unlike some of the programs where you have to, there's like a deadline to submit your um, suggestions for awards or things like that, this is open year round. So whenever you come across a book that you think would be a good title, just you know, go here. You know, get the information to to the the group, and it'll be you know, added to the list of of books to uh, consider. You don't have to wait and figure out: Did I get it in on time? Did I miss the deadline? There is none. And there's also a response that the nomination has been received, and that's uh, a very solid part of this as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just disappearing out into the ether. 
<laughs> it's not just a meta nomination. It's <laughs> Poor Krista. Sorry, Jen. <laughs> Poor Tessa. It's okay. I'm never going to leave it down. <laughs> You're my friend. <laughs> oh, definitely. All right. Um, it doesn't look like anybody had typed in any other questions. Just um, yay for the discussion questions. Thank you so much for those comments coming from people. They always appreciate that. And um, people have already read it, saying they really enjoyed the book. Thank you so much. Um, look forward to having you, uh, Jim, having you come and speak at our library at some point. So hopefully uh, you um, be getting some re uh, um, requests from people. Great. And of course, we're talking going as this would be all virtual, <laughs> um, the way, you know, Jim's in New Jersey, we're here. Um, but we, over the past year, we've all learned, if we haven't already been doing this, how to do these virtual events and sessions. So it should be no, no problem to get this all set up for you. Mm -hmm. Great. I look forward to it. Yeah. All right. Anybody have any other last minute desperate questions, comments, anything you want to say? I think maybe we can wrap it up now. We're a little after 2 p.m. here. Um, we'll get a good uh, Erica. I just saw she left. She had to leave. She had another meeting at 2 o'clock. So she's already um, gone, um, but she had another meeting to go to. But Anybody has anything else you want to say? Anything you want to wrap up? I think we have our last slide here was just the contact info for, for Tessa here and the page for the one book. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. Yep, um, I'm available for questions. If you guys have anything that you're confused about the one book program, you can send me an email or give me a call and I'll try to answer them for you or get you to the person who can answer them for you. Mm -hmm. And of course, go to the website um, for even more information to get involved, get the copy of the book. We'll add information about the um, documentary onto here. And if Jim's sending us a copy, we'll have a copy that we'll be able to lend out from here as well. For Beautiful. people. Yeah. Perfect. Bring your popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't think anybody said any other questions. This is great. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you much, so much, Jim, for joining us um, and everybody for being able to uh, accommodate our special uh, time. Usually our, our uh, Encompass Live is usually at 10 a.m. on Wednesday mornings, but um, we did a little adjustment for today to make sure we could have everybody participate, especially wanted to have Jim with us, the author of our um, One Book, One Nebraska selection, Prairie Forge. Um, so this is great that we've got everybody here. So thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, as I said, we are recording. Let's see, let me get my back to my Encompass Live page, wherever I was. There we go. And this is our Encompass Live website where we have our upcoming shows here. Um, if you go to your search engine of choice and just type in Encompass Live, the name of the show, so far it's the only thing called that on the internet. No one else is allowed to use the name. <laughs> and you will come up with our main page and our archive page. These are upcoming shows. The archives are right here and they are the most recent one at the top of the page. So uh, today's will be there, uh, should be done and posted by uh, the end of the day tomorrow, as long as go to webinar and YouTube, I'll cooperate with me. Um, I have a link to today's show. Uh, link to the slides that we may or may not fix, fix typo in, tens and if we like it that way or not. <laughs> um, everybody who attended today and uh, um, registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is ready. Uh, while I'm here, I'll show you this is our um, we have a search feature here on our archives. If you want to watch any of our previous shows, you can um, search for a topic that you might be interested in. Um, you can search the full archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want to. That is because uh, this is the full archives for Encompass Live. The show premiered in Jan uh, January 2009. So we have over 10 years worth of recordings here. Um, and as long as the internet exists and YouTube hosts our um, recordings, we'll keep them up. 
Uh, so just pay attention when you are watching any of our archive, just pay attention to the original broadcast date to see when that show uh, originally was done. Uh, some shows will stand the test of time, book reading lists, things like that, it'll always be good, but some things will become old and outdated. There may be services or products that have changed, links might not work anymore, uh, websites might be gone, whatever, um, but just pay attention to the date if you do watch something to make sure that, you know, that information may or may not still be um, accurate um, or even available. But back to our main page here. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. As I said, Ev, I'll let you all know when the recording is available. And um, next week on Encompass Live, we will be talking about becoming a librarian, education programs leading to credentials in librarianship. Uh, some of our staff from our library school programs here in Nebraska. Uh, Dr. Sarah Churchill, Judy Henning, and Dr. Becky Pasco will be with us to talk about um, uh, getting your degrees and uh, credentials that might help you get employed as a librarian after going through the library school program. So please do join us for next week's show. Sign up for that if you're interested in um, getting your degree. And any of our other shows we have here, we've got our February dates filled in. I'm getting the March dates uh, finalized as well. So you'll see more of those topics, more of those filled in as well. Um, other than uh, that, that does uh, wrap it up for today's show. Oh, we do have a Facebook page as well. I just want to show you that over here. If um, you like to use Facebook to keep up on things, uh, give us a like. We promote, you know, when our shows are coming up, when the recordings are available, all of that on here as well. So give us a like on Facebook if you want to. Other than that, thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and hopefully we'll see you on a future Encompass Live. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. See you later. My button there.